Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Pleased to be with you today, as always. And I've got a great show for you today, a conversation I've been wanting to have. The guest who will be here a little bit later is Sarah L. Caldi. And she offers higher dimensional guidance through spiritual awakenings. And Sarah is here to talk with us today because she assists humanity's evolution. This is Dare to Dream. It won the COV Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show. It is listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. It is nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards and a Webby Award high-ranking self-improvement show on Apple Podcasts. So you can find us on any major platform, including in video, on YouTube, and in Spotify. So if you like this conversation and you're listening and you want to see us, head on over to YouTube or Spotify, join us, subscribe, and like. And this show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They do energy work out into the world. If you would like to join them in a class or become a facilitator, go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com or accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I am a book writing coach. I do take your book to a guaranteed international bestselling status, and I do all the heavy lifting for the author. I'm also a boutique publicist. And I am about to offer a free live masterclass and people are starting to sign up. I'm very excited. This is going to be held. Well, I'll tell you what, the date is on the registration. I'm saying that because I may offer the live webinar a few other times in the future. So you want to sign up, but you have to sign up to get the Zoom link. And basically it's for all of you spiritual messengers. I am giving you the tips on how to get podcasts and media bookings, even if you don't know where the shows are. So I'll be covering what it takes to be featured in the media that you love, how to identify the visibility blind spots that are holding you back, and clarity on your action steps so you can reach more people with your message. Go to www.my visibility.site slash registration. That'll be in the show notes. So it's www.myvisibility.site slash registration. And I'll see you at the live webinar. Let's get you out there. So my guest today is Sarah L. Caldi, who is a mystic and a spiritual teacher. Sarah is highly claircognizant. Her intuitive abilities and deep insights into the nature of reality create energetic transmissions that activate the audience on a soul level. She is widely known as a leader in the field of spirituality and the esoteric arts. She uses her intuitive abilities as her extensive background in esoteric knowledge to help humanity gracefully tap into our evolutionary potential. With an online community consisting of hundreds of thousands of awakening souls, it is her highest honor to assist humanity's evolution. And to learn more about her, go to thealchemist.community. And with that, I welcome the beautiful Sarah to Dare to Dream. It is so great to have you. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. And you are traveling. Tell us where you are. I'm in Switzerland currently for my alchemy retreat here, which is in the Alps. It's amazing. It's like, it doesn't look real. It doesn't sound real. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What are people getting from this retreat? So what they're taking away is pretty much the bare bones of what is universal within mysticism. And so mysticism, as you may already know, has different threads, comes from different backgrounds and traditions. Um, a lot of terminology can get very confusing because one tradition will be referring to certain terms and they will not mean the same thing as another tradition. And so there's just a lot of different veins that a person can travel within mysticism itself. And so this is a foundational course mm. for the next five days where we cover, we demystify mysticism. Oh, that's great. We bring clarity to the esoteric mm. and then it really helps activate people's spiritual awakening. It takes them to that next level. So what I do is I gauge, it's not cookie cutter at all. If I notice that 
the attendees in any retreat start to really have questions or focus on one aspect or one particular concept or, or even um, teaching, then I hone in on that and I bring clarity and, and I, I will expand on that more. Um, or I may just go into different threads, but with the clarity of knowing what each school stands in and then where I stand in. Because to be quite honest with you, a lot of where I come from, I'm simply using as a bridge. Mm -hmm. I'm fully running off of my own gnosis, which is the point mm -hmm. of mysticism. The point of true mysticism is to never keep you dependent on it. It's to get you fully into that higher state of your own knowing so that you're a clear enough channel, you're a clear enough antenna of source of divine wisdom and knowledge within and without. And so because of that, I share where my personal background has led, which through the many different traditions, but also where my evolution has taken it. And with that, there's a level of sovereignty that I give the attendees. Which is beautiful. Yeah, I love that. So no dependence at all, but learning to depend on oneself activated from the knowledge that they're receiving through you, from you. I, are you going to be doing activations on all of us as we talk to you today? Um, the activation is already coming through. Okay, cool. Yeah. I, I know I'll feel it anyway, because I'll get super puddled at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But good to ask. So everybody's aware that they're getting all these beautiful gifts from you. And your name, Sarah Elk. Aldi. So there's elk in there, which makes it feels very native. It feels very indigenous. Is there something to your name? Were you born with that name, given that name? So I was born with that name. I love this question, by the way, because nobody really asks this question. And it's so funny because elk, does, I'm, I am fully aware that it comes with a native tone. Mm -hmm. And I'm Arab. Interesting. So and Spanish on my mother's side, but more so Arab, because my dad's full-blooded Libyan. Okay. And so what, what is El Khaldi now actually started out as El Haldi, A-L-L, -L, meaning the, what tribe you're from, and then Haldi, which means eternity, which is so funny, because eternity has been the theme for me this life, so of course. So El Haldi, when he came over here, somehow got turned into El Caldi. And I kind of think it's funny that I can get away with being like, wait, is she Native American? She looks like it, but she's this, or that. I like being miss, missed. Identified. <laughs> yeah. Because then you could say things, uh, you know, or you could, you could just share things and people aren't able to fully like try to bring in their programming or their ego to be like, hey, blah, blah, blah. and so I, I actually think I designed it that way. I think I, I purposely designed it. It's just like, what am I? What's my name from? It's like, don't pay attention to any of that. Now you can't, you know, like, a, I can't be appropriated, right? <laughs> it's a mystery for the mystic. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, it's a beautiful name. And it really does have an indigenous native quality. And, and we're going to get to that because, you know, my brain is screaming to jump there, but I, I want to build a little bit of a platform of understanding first. And thank you for the explanation. It's beautiful. The work you do in my research on you, it it involves you speaking, leading these retreats. You gave us some of that. And I know a lot of your work deals with alchemy and ascension and shadow work, biggies. Why those three? What is the importance of those three and where do they intersect? Those three can be looked at as a trinity. Alchemy is the ascension through shadow work. So shadow work in this case doesn't necessarily always need to be specifically for doing the inner processing of our detrimental aspects. Um, but typically what's going on when we're talking about alchemy from a spiritual level is the reconfiguration. There's a reclaiming. Alchemy is 
synonymous with rectifying something, rectifying and reclaiming. So what's being reclaimed? Whatever is lost at sea, if you will, within the shadow. So this isn't anything along the lines of a one-dimensional way that I'm portraying the shadow. It's not just about our detrimental aspects. It's any way that we can fragment, any way that we are under spiritual amnesia, any way that we are not in full liberation. So I would equate spiritual alchemy with the full liberation, the, the ascension. So in alchemy, there's this concept of the relationship between art and nature. Art doesn't mean art. Art means our free will, what we do. Here, you're given this life. Do you choose to continue along an automated road? In mysticism, that's why it goes hand in hand with alchemy, because mysticism is all about waking a person up out of the automation, out of the machine level of consciousness, the one that's just a reflex. There's no consciousness behind that. Have you ever noticed how sometimes we just rely on packaged phrases that just yes. have been handed down, handed down? And then it's like, mm -hmm. is there any creative ingenuity, like a fingerprint that we have imprinted on even our speech? So alchemy, even down to that level, is noticing within us the mechanical self, the programmed self, and then going in the direction of consciousness. So it's that shadow work and that inner work of creating a whole and sanctified being through that rectification process. So rectification process in this case is saying that it's implying we are, we have all the ingredients for our wholeness. And it's simply a matter of reconfiguring. It's simply a matter of integration. And that process is the process that we also know as ascension. So alchemy is the ascension through shadow work. Wow. I know, okay, I know how shadow work works. So I want to hear how you address it because it's been my experience when I've done it, especially in a group situation, I've definitely been around people who don't see it, right? Um, and they don't understand, I'll, I'll put it down to this, that, you know, three fingers pointing at you and excuse me, one finger pointing at you, three back at me. So anything you say about somebody else, essentially, if the world is an illusion that you're enacting in your world, you're projecting. And it's actually something that belongs to you that you've disowned. And so you you are completely disengaged from it, unaware of it. But, but I notice a lot of people don't have a good time finding that or understanding exactly what's going on there. And yeah, let's start there. What is your thoughts and how do you help people with that? It's a matter of sincerity. If a person, like, if I, I have a saying, if you are sincere, nothing can stop you. If you are not sincere, nothing can help you. You could be given all the tools in the world and you will deflect. You will simply deny or deflect. And so denial, you could look at is the oppositional force to awakening. Um, I think I just came in with a level of sincerity to be quite honest with you. And it wasn't necessarily because I'm sincere. It's because I'm open, mm -hmm. I'm receptive. I know I project my masculinity, but I'm able to do that because I have such a secure and stable inner yin, inner feminine reality. And all I mean by that, I don't mean feminine and maybe the way that some people mean it. What I mean is receptive, open, inward. And so some people are more yang. There's nothing wrong with either of these, by the way. Some people are more yang. Some people are more yin. The problem with people who are more yin in their inner reality is like an inner gaslighting that goes on. So it's not a problem of deflecting. We don't deny. In fact, we do the opposite. We, we have to kind of like sift through what's not ours because we take it all on. We go, am I that? Is it me? Because <laughs> we're just imprinting. You know, the feminine energy is the reciprocal. So it just, it imp the masculine imprints onto it. 
And so the world being, let's say the external world being the masculine will imprint whatever it is. And so the journey for some people is to actually kind of like not take things on, but not from a place of denial, from a place of like clarity. And so to get back to the sincerity, it's not because as I was saying, it's like, oh, I'm so sincere. It's because I'm just so open. And people who are more open, they're more able to receive things whether it's some sort of um, feedback or some, I mean, this isn't all the time. If feedback is coming clearly from a distorted source, no. But that's also a part of the trials for people of this. It's, it's discerning if this is a distorted source or not, because the problem once again is just taking on, taking on. And so it's this funny, almost, you know, I'm just relating this in another way. I'm not being serious, but it's almost like a narcissistic thing. It's like, everything's about me, me, <laughs> me. <laughs> and so looking at it that way, um, it, it's just you're able more to be open. And so to answer your question, it's a matter of sincerity, but more so to be more technical, the level of the capacity for openness because if a person has come from a background where they had a lot of verbal, you know, mental or even physical abuse, you know, would you expect them to be closed off to criticism? Rightfully so. So even finding safe people and safe spaces to do work is super critical. A lot of times people make the mistake of thinking that you just need to be open. You just need to be vulnerable. No, vulnerability is a treasure. So it needs to be guarded because it can be taken advantage of from people who aren't at a level of sincerity to actually reciprocate that. Yeah, I completely resonate with what you're saying on so many levels. I almost feel like I've got a foot in every camp. I mean, I'm <laughs> incredibly open and my greatest value this life has been spirituality and growing. It's It's been amazing. It saved me. On the other hand, yeah, I think I have a little bit of that the everything is me quality. And for sure, what you just said. Um, and it's really powerful stuff. Uh, having grown up in a, a challenging situation as a child and a young adult, I find that the way things are delivered is everything. And I can not receive it all because it feels so critical and judgmental and um so I just sort of become Teflon, if you will. And it bounces right off of me because I, I can't. But if somebody is a good communicator and they can couch things in a way that can be received, because I do love to receive whatever, I feel like it's important on all levels, then I can very much uh, receive the, the truth or their truth, you know, of what's going on. And I don't, I don't find that many people have great communication skills. Um, and that, that can be challenging too, you know, to try to have a, a conversation towards resolution and hope the other party can really meet you, you know, really show up in their adult and in ownership too of their own stuff. I think that's really important when disseminating this information. Yeah, absolutely. And so what I heard from you is that like, you're just tapped into your highest wisdom. It's mm -hmm. like, I'm not going to take feedback from everyone. <laughs> Just completely discerning. <laughs> oh, cool. Thank you for that. That's a, a great way to look at it. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm really not. I think there's a lot of wounded people out there, you know, yeah. and, um... now because I'm so open, what I do behind closed doors is if I don't like something in the world, because I'm so secure with myself. I still look for the tiniest commonality I have because I am a vibrational match to this reality. It doesn't need to be like, you're doing that thing, you're doing that, but it can be things that when I really kind of pull on the thread and I follow it, mm -hmm. I notice like, wow, I've either done that in the past or I'm doing it now, but it's done in a totally benign or like unconscious way to yes. where it's not, yes. it's not like aggressive or causing this, but so that's just because once again, like I, I'm just a person who's more concerned with sincerity rather than trying to put up, put up a front. Yes. Got it. 
you also do spoken word in Los Angeles, where, where I am. So I hope I'll be invited when you do this next. Tell me about your spoken word. Tell me about what people receive when they come to a theater or an, a venue to watch you. Yeah, you know, I really want to get back into that because I haven't done a performance in a while. And I even now find teaching to be easier than performing because I'm just flowing now. And and I'm like, oh my God, am I going to remember the lines? And it's like, but anyways, um, I really enjoyed doing spoken word and I do want to somehow bring that back in, incorporate it. There's not really those outlets and you would think in Los Angeles, out of all places, there's those platforms and I'm sure there are, but not at the capacity, you know, there, I've been to some cafes in Santa Monica where they have, you know, throwaway night, you just come up there but I'm talking about like full-blown performances. Somehow that was just a part of my reality for some time. And I, I don't even know where to start with finding those outlets anymore. So I'm fortunately at a place in my own life where I don't need to depend on those platforms. I can create them myself. And so I will definitely start focusing on that again. Um, but for the time being in my in-person events, my soul gatherings, I've started the habit of coming out, doing a spoken word performance. So that's fun. Oh, they're so lucky. That is great. And so when you do this, is this just, it's like rapping in a way is completely organic. What comes out of you? Or do you know you're doing a theme? How do you start? Oh, so it's from my books. I have two books of poetry, um, but they're activations. My, my poetry is not going to pay the bills but it's a labor of love. It's one of my passions. And so because of that, I don't view it as oppositional to my teaching career. Um, if anything, my spoken word are, are very strong activations, if I do say so myself. And activations are strongest when they're bypassing the logical mind and they're just tapping in, you know, whether to the heart field or whether just going deep inside and re-scrambling. And that's what they do. They do that in a positive way. They actually clear creative blocks because of how, not rhymey, but but yeah, how 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 non-linear they are, how you can make art from words, how you could say something in a way that's way powerful and profound other than just saying it in a simple way. And that's what I challenge myself with, with my poetry. Beautiful. Well, I know that you have been involved with shamanism. There's, I've seen shamanism in connection with you. And I would love to know who you've worked with, how you studied, how you utilize it. That's a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Yeah, so my shaman, I call her my shaman now, but when I first met her, she was a shaman who was transitioning into quantum work. And what she had told me was that shamanic work is at the fourth dimensional layer. And that quantum work is fifth dimensional and beyond. And so when I had first reached out to her, it was because I was enormously concentrated on soul retrievals. And I had been looking for a shaman for about a few months before somebody had thrown her name out. And it's funny because it was so aligned, like the other shamans who I had reached out to had like their email domains just returned to me or, or like there was just always some issue. It was never just like, oh, I'm this price, you know, let's work together. Like there was always some sort of universal block. And then I was like, you know what? the universe is going to bring me my shaman to do my soul retrieval. Okay. And so from there, somebody was just talking at an LA party one time about like, yeah, my mom's going to the shaman and blah, blah. And I was like, give me her, give me her website. She was like, I don't know, because she kind of talks about space stuff, like implants and aliens and abductions. Mm -hmm. Like she's not a shaman. Like you're thinking of a shaman. Wow. She's not like about the earth with a drum. And I'm like, no, you don't understand what you just said is like exactly what I'm looking for in a shaman. Yes. <laughs> and so yeah, um, I ended up being her client for a while. And then when she transitioned fully out of shamanic work and into quantum work, I had become her student, a part of her new modality. 
The reason why I'm very careful as to say her name, because I love her and I would love to give her any attention is because she simply doesn't want it. She's retired and she's from a tradition that I don't know if you're familiar with Castaneda's work. Yes. hundred percent. Mm -hmm. She's not from that tradition, but it's the same thing. It's about clearing your vibrational energy field, raising yourself into the luminous body mm -hmm. and then catapulting out of this arena, out of the earth arena. And so what she finds counterintuitive at this time while she's retiring is having a lot of the attention that I would bring her because I'm a mixed bag. All, it's not all good attention. And so, yeah, I even brought that up to her about six months ago and she was like, Amazing. but yeah, um, she was from the, she's from the Peruvian lineage. Okay. Well, I'm fascinated by that. And so I'm just finishing, I'm graduating in two weeks from a six month shamanic course with Dr. Alberto Violdo. Yes. And beautiful work. Also Peruvian Inca Cuero tribe. I love this work so much. It's totally changed my life and I plan to change other people's lives with it. And how do you incorporate this into what you're doing? Like, how did it alter what you do and how you work with people? It was the foundation. So what I, I attract a lot of clients who want to step into their power or who are already a practitioner of some sort, or who just want to get started. They want me to start teaching my modality that I have that evolved from my own, you know, gnosis. And so what I tell them is just learn anything that you feel drawn to because it will evolve. It's almost, almost impossible for you to take on a modality and not have it evolve in some way. And so because of that, what I practice now, I couldn't even call what it started out mm -hmm. as. Yes. I have learned so many different mm -hmm. modalities and I've taken the best of them and some of them have been great and I've taken none of it, but it's been great to learn. And I've just pieced them together into what I have found like the best of. And so my modality, alchemical energy healing is the evolution of all of my path. Yeah, what I really like about what you're saying, Sarah, as well is a lot of what I just learned, for instance, is a very one-on-one -on -one situation. And I, I'm at a point in my life where it's about the one-to-many conversation. And I think it's a lot of work, the one-to-one, -one. Um, beautiful. And maybe appropriate for some people, but in general, I'm really looking for the group situations and how to channel a lot of what I learned into group, including things like soul retrievals or extractions, et cetera, divinations. Um, and I love that you're able to do that, able to take and call from all the different things you've learned, put it into the soup of Sarah L. Caldi, and you know it comes out the other side as something that's really indigenous to you, through you. Yeah, I really enjoy the process too. And it's funny because sometimes I'll be on the phone with the client, they'll be asking me questions and all of a sudden I'll start calibrating their questions way different. And I'm like, why am I doing that? Why am I not just plugging into my crown? And it's like, no, I feel like using the, you know, um, David Hawkins map. Oh, oh great. Yes. Or, oh, oh it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Like it, it's, it's fun. Like there's, there's a freedom that comes with being able to be well-versed or, you know, um, have different modalities under your belt because sometimes mm -hmm for some reason, and I don't question it anymore, sometimes some modalities that even I'm like, oh no, this is what they need. It actually, like the client would, the client's energy field would actually like this one thing from this one modality. I'm like, okay, I, you know, okay, adrenals, whatever, I learned it. <laughs> Right. So is this where your clear cognizance comes in or is there something else higher? Well, if you could call it that at work, just something divine that comes through you that you really can perceive what is best for somebody. I just call it the clear cognizance. Um, I'm really tapping into their higher self. Mm -hmm. Their higher self is relaying to me exactly what frequencies 
some of them, I'll, I'll give you an example. I won't be so big. Please. Are you familiar with Roundup? I am not. Sounds like, no, here in Los Angeles, that's a bug spray. <laughs> yes. yes. It is? Roundup, okay. Yeah. Didn't think I was going there, did you? No, I did not. <laughs> yeah. Like Roundup will the higher self, because the higher self is the one who chooses the modality. That's why I'm just kind of like there with my, I'm there with my database. The higher self goes, okay, these are Sarah's tools. Okay. And so the higher self is the one that does the work. Oh, that's hilarious. So yes. Sometimes the higher, like someone might come to me with depression, let's say, or they want to get connected to their own higher self. They want to receive their own information. They don't want to go to people for it. They want to have that, you know, connection, whatever it may be. And let's just say that the higher self goes to choose to start eliminating Roundup from their system. Hmm. Now for me, I'm a little traditional. I just always go to soul retrieval. That's my button. I just go soul retrieval, soul retrieval. But the higher self doesn't do that. And so why would Roundup being a stressor on the system and needing to be harmonized? Because that's the harmonization process, just like hom homeopathy or some forms of kinesiology. When the higher self is tapping into the frequency of eliminating Roundup, it's trying to harmonize the client's energy field to this substance. And through that harmonization, the body, the energy field wakes up to this stressor and goes, now I have the information to know what to do with it. So it can go through either strengthening the body against this. So a resiliency or an elimination and a resiliency still. But do you see how in an indirect way, if Roundup is stressing out your neurological system, your gut brain access, your musculoskeleton, I could go on and on, how that would put a damper on a person's mood or even have them feel a complete loss of connection. Like, like it's and to the nth degree, we could see the causes, for, uh, the ripple effect from that. And so that's really special about having a wide tool case. It's the higher self is enormously creative with their vantage point. And they'll choose things that I go like, that was soft, but it's not because that's exactly what they needed. They didn't need what Sarah thinks is best for them. The higher self knows how much an energy field can handle, how much is too much, what order something needs to be in. They have the higher vantage point and I want the higher self to receive all the praise because I also know that praise comes with blame. <laughs> what kind of state do you get yourself into that you are that receptive, that you can receive that information? You've got your arsenal at your disposal and your mind, you said, has this default soul retrieval. But the higher self of the client comes in and says, no, actually what she, he needs is, and supersedes your best instinct in that moment. Where are you at? How, and how do you get there that you are able to tune in like that? I go into an altered state of consciousness, which is now very popular in this age. So I'm glad it's the gamma brainwave state. When I started using the gamma brainwave state, it was not popular. Mm. In fact, I remember I was posting one time, I was excited. I think it was even on Facebook, maybe about like, oh, gamma brainwave tracks. And I remember somebody being very aggressive and talking about how that hemisync technology is actually used for mind control. And this is dangerous and dark. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm not telling people that anymore. But now it's like very common in the spiritual community. And yeah. it's, it, the gamma brainwave state is the equivalent to the fifth dimension. Now, there are higher states than gamma, just like there are higher states of dimensions than the fifth, but the gamma brainwave state corresponds to the fifth dimension and the sixth, but yeah. Ooh, thank you for that answer, because yeah. I'm going to play with that. Uh, I'm, I have hemisync, and I haven't used it in probably a decade or two, <laughs> whenever it was first so popular. 
and um, very interesting. And uh, what an easy way to to do that, to get out of the way. Yeah, it took me a while to get out of the way, though. Mm. I have done work to get out of my way. At first, even before I was able to practice the modality, I had to work through anger at the fact that I wasn't receiving visuals the way that I was learning they should be received. But that's once again, because when you're comparing yourself to a clairvoyant and you're a claircognizant, like that's just not going to add up. So honoring my own capacities or where they thrive, you know, because I have third eye activity, but it's not what you would consider like a straight up clairvoyant. I see visuals, I see third eye activity, but I consider clairvoyant a completely different class than third eye activity. And so, yes, I have third eye activity all the time, but it showed up late to the party. It's kind of like I filled up on chips. And so, <laughs> oh, hi. Okay. Yeah, you can come. <laughs> how, how do you, how would you describe the difference between clairsentience and claircognizance? I mean, sentience of course is all about sensitivity and feelings and cognizance is about knowing, but what in the, in the receiving or the gift, how is that different? In the receiving, it's like, there's just this organization that you take credit for. Mm -hmm. It's like things unravel in front of you and you see like these concepts and you go, oh, mm -hmm. you go, I did that. <laughs> but with clairsentience, you're tapping in to the visceral knowledge, the knowledge in its form of will, knowledge in its visceral form. And so I'm clairsentient as well. And I use them together, mm. but I'm dominant in my knowing. And I prefer that that way. Like I could pay as much attention to my sentience, but you know, like just my ancestry <laughs> has a lot of sentience. So it's just best to go into my knowing. <laughs> oh, that makes a lot of it's sense. It's just intense, you know, like I'm intense. In a beautiful way. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. You know, and I, I'm discovering some of what you're talking about. You know, one of the things we do is tracking, whether it's, I mean, you don't have to use a drum and you don't have to use a rattle, but I do like the rattle. I find it's helpful to me, Either, whether I'm going to the upper world or underworld, or I'm hanging out, asking specific questions or doing, um, doing some work on a client and I'm finding I mean, I'm just so surprised <laughs> sometimes when gifts show up and the way they show up and I'm feeling so strong in the tracking, like really receiving clear information for people. And of course, it's super helpful when you come out and you share some of these things with people and they're like, yes, exactly. And they start to explain what in my world wouldn't make sense. And the other day I was doing... Um, I think I was going to be doing an extraction on somebody, but I was also tracking and I was receiving explicit medical information for this person. And I was like, that has never been a thing for me. That is so interesting. And it was wonderful. They were showing me like, it was like an x-ray of a body. I was looking at this person's body and they went, this is where the original accident happened, but that's not the problem. But you want to look at L4 and L5 and here's how we're going to fix it. And the reason why this shoulder is having a problem and they were showing me all this stuff. I felt like a kid, like, wow, this is so cool. Um, yeah. And, you know, I'm learning, get out of the way, honey, <laughs> just let it happen because I, I couldn't make this stuff up if I tried to, and it would never be as cool if I tried to, but to get out of the way and allow myself to be shown these things, it feels like this incredibly high honor to be able to help somebody like that. And I think of people like Carolyn Mace or, you know, there's an amazing medical intuitives and I don't know that I'll ever claim that, but to even, you know, have that experience of receiving anatomical medical information for somebody I thought was crazy. And they were telling her what to do too. What not, stop doing this. It's not working for you. Start doing this. It's going to be better and go get an MRI. And here is where we want you to have the film. And I'm like, 
okay, I will do that. And here's the emotional component too. <laughs> it was amazing stuff, you know, and I'm loving the ride. Yeah. And that doesn't surprise me that you're tuning into that in the rattle, because that's how my shaman at least started off getting into altered state of consciousness. The, the rattle is typically, depending on how it's used, equated with theta. Ooh. Yeah. And so theta, that's where everything's at, you know, that's where the underworld, that's where everything you're saying, you know, totally adds up. Awesome. I've got this quote from you, Sarah, which is, <clears throat> fate is not causal, it can only compel. What this means is it doesn't cause anything to happen, even though it looks as though it does, because fate is a pattern. It is the conditions to create the perfect storm. It is the ingredients to create a given recipe. It is not the recipe itself. It is the momentum behind a pattern that supplies us and guides us through our life path. Whoa, that's powerful. So fate and it's being a perfect storm and all its ramifications. Tell me, how is fate a pattern and a condition? We come into multiple layers of fate. We come into our family genetics. Mm. We come in with what we wish to accomplish or experience as a purpose or focal point in this life. We come in with even our own soul stream. What we feel personally was something that was incomplete, unfinished business, as they say. We come in as a collective vibrational match. So we have overlapping lessons, and then we have unique or personal ones, and so forth. And so they're all this perfect storm. They're like all mixed in a bag. But within that, there's the, the free will component. And the free will component is the one that comes in and says, look, fate sets you up. And I don't mean that in a mean way. Fate sets you up. When you came in, you were a bowling ball. You came out of the womb with momentum and the bowling ball is rolling. And it's like, okay, that's the momentum. What, what I'm calling fate. The free will is what comes in and says, what are you going to do with that now? I came in with all my fate set up to be autoimmune. I lived that fate out. I lived it out. So in that way, fate can look like it was an inevitable. It was unavoidable. It was really, really probable. Fate is really, really probable to where it looks like you didn't even have a choice. Because some fate actually has you go through a process, but it does not tell you how the story ends. This is how it ends. So it compels what I'm calling momentum. What I'm calling fate is compelling. It's like, oh, now could I have made choices earlier on in my life to advert my fate in autoimmunity? Yes, I could have, but the fate was strong in this one. <laughs> <laughs> the fate was strong and I wasn't paying attention to my body. I was neglecting it. Common spiritual error, right? Spiritual people have that issue. But what I did later on was use my free will to go, okay, I dug a very deep, you know, hole, but how do I get out of it? And my free will found methods and modalities that I don't practice, that I don't want to practice, but that nobody would even ever know about exist. They would be considered magic. And magic, where magic meets science, basically. where Because it's not just magic, where magic meets science. But I had the absolute will to find and research and, and do everything to overcome that momentum of the bowling ball that says, th that's the end. That's just fate. Now, when you do that, you're using your free will. Now, fate doesn't become the inevitable, the end story. Now, fate became a rite of passage. Congratulations. 
you have overcome or you have passed the threshold or you have learned or completed your fate, when you do that, you step into the doorway of destiny now. Destiny is free will. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, when you say where magic and science coincide, can you give us some example of what you mean yeah. by that? Yeah, so I had searched for a for two and a half to three years for modalities because when I started kinesiology and I was with, you know, chiropractors, all the chiropractors, at least in California, are energy healers too. So a lot of my colleagues are actually chiropractors. When I learn new seminars, I, I see more so chiropractors than I do you know, non-chiropractors or, you know, very forward thinking doctors even sometimes. Um, and so these modalities were kind of making me open up my thinking. They, they weren't the ones that saved me, like, like muscle testing, all, all these things pointed to things, but my issues, um, cause I had also attained a nervous system injury. So I was like deep in the red. It wasn't just autoimmune at that point. Now I had nervous system injury. And so these modalities I, were, I was learning were great and they, they help on one capacity, you know, like at a mental, spiritual, emotional level. But when it comes to the physical, they could not complete the job. They could start healing crises, but they could not finish them. And But being introduced to this new world, which was more what I was doing in energy work, but it was totally focused on the physical rather than how I've been, if, was focusing on it from the spiritual, the energetic, the emotional. I started opening up what I felt was possible. So I went, okay, well, this stuff exists and it's not working, but that doesn't mean that there's not some forward things that I just haven't caught up to yet. And so I started putting crazy things in the searches and I started doing like, I like, I have been a detective. I was spared nothing. Like it wasn't like, oh my God, it was just a line. No, I did blood, sweat, and tears research. And I found this one bioresonance practice. And I had been to a few at that point. And once again, they were all provoking the autoimmunity, but they weren't actually resolving it. They weren't getting to the root of it. So I started looking deeper and deeper into this one bioresonance modality. And they had like from over the world, a lot of different reviews and doctors were even using them in certain parts. And they had like an annual conference. Like it was the most legit setup of bioresonance I had seen. And so my intuition just told me, this is what you've been looking for. You've been looking for this bioresonance machine. Um, it's called the BICOM, B-I-C-O-M. And at that point, it just became finding a practitioner. And I found one at one point, and to be quite honest, I say this with no malice, but um, she did not know how to use the machine to its fullest. And I spent quite a lot of time with her, but I did not give up on the machine itself. And so I found someone overseas who could work on me remotely. And at that point, I was throwing a Hail Mary. Within a month, my autoimmune symptoms were becoming less apparent. Within five months, I didn't have any function loss to identify that, oh, I still have Hashimoto's or, oh, I still have eczema or, oh, I still have lupus. Like there was nothing to identify it, right? Because you can identify something through symptoms. Symptoms show, look, hello, this is a loss of function. You have lost function. By five months, there was no more loss of function. In fact, there was a recovery. In physical, in the physical world, all they tell you is, look, you're lucky if you stop this and, and it'll slowly still climb. It won't fully stop, but you're lucky if you slow this down. There's no such thing as repair. No, I had no loss of functions by even five months in. And then from there and there and there, it's just getting healthier. And so because of that, all of that was made possible by the fact that I refused to succumb to, well, I'm being told by Western medicine or even by chiropractor or by any, I, I simply did not succumb to my fate. 
I went, no, there is, if this exists, there's something beyond this that exists and I'm going to find my mad scientist. And now I have a healing team. But the reason why I have a healing team now isn't for my autoimmunity necessarily. It's because of my nervous system injury, which is also like this ongoing upgrade. So it's something that's, you know, going to be brewing. Amazing. I'm so grateful you said all of that and kudos to you to not give up in the face of being told just the way it is. And I relate deeply to that. I had also an autoimmune disease. Oh, and I would go to doctors who could not classify it. And it actually took me digging very deeply to find a physician's PowerPoint somehow online and reading into it and being able to say, I I'm pretty sure I know what's going on here. And doctor after doctor um, giving ridiculous steroids and things that only created more symptoms and atrophied and looking at the reality that was out there, it told me that everybody in my situation, she, that's too bad. You will live with this for the rest of your life. And this is the only thing we can offer you. And I was on groups and chats until I got angry. I mean, I lived with it for 10 years until I got really pissed. And then I said, I'm not going to live like this. I'm going to be whole. I don't care what it takes. I'm a metaphysician. That has to be so. I'm a creator. And it took years for me too of unearthing and reading and following people who seem to be having success. And, uh, you know, and then honestly, the universe finally just said, poor thing, let's bring her a miracle. And I was speaking on stage and they brought me somebody who was in the audience and came to me. We just felt so drawn to have a conversation. I had no idea what this man did. And it turned out he completely knew my situation and this particular disease. I told him what I was about to do. He said, please do not. It will not help you come to my facility we're going to treat you. And, it, you know, I had to travel, whatever. I did it. And he healed me to this day. You know, he's an angel. And, um, and so for people who are listening, Sarah, somebody out there who has cancer and, it, you know, say so suddenly find out, my God, it's, mis I thought it was this and being kept and they had, it had boundaries, but suddenly it's metastasized. And, somebody el else who has arthritis, which is its own pain point and all the different diagnoses out there who's listening to you and feeling like, I want that. Where can they start? Where can they open themselves or bring in or look or what would you recommend for their journey? Their intuition mixed with like removing any type of programming that is of a nature of limiting self-beliefs because the limiting self-beliefs are ingrained with us within the institutions, within our own internal system within our emotional body um because at that point a person chronically ill their baseline is hopelessness to say the very least um inner work because the inner work is it not going to be not typically going to be the thing that oh wow i am fully healed but what it's going to do is two very important things one it's going to get put into the bank put into the reserves of healing the epigenetic component involved. And then more to the point, the more direct one would be what it's going to do is shift your point of attraction. When you shift your point of attraction, all of a sudden, you might not have a miracle, even though miracles, I'm always open to them. Let's always keep ourselves open to them. But what they will do is give you the people, places, and things, right? So all of a sudden, maybe you'll be like, wow, I found that doctor. Or wow, somebody would, because they shift your point of attraction. The emo You know this, the emotional body is directly correlated to the physical body. So here, it's in the all layers, mind, body, emotions, spirit, all of them need to be addressed. And then from there, using the intuition, but at a, a larger liberated capacity to kind of allow it to follow threads that it might not have felt were possible. Because that's how I did it. I just went, no, it's, I'm not going down like that. Mm -hmm. 
And do you recommend that people also use the medical society? I mean, because they are very good at diagnosing, at least to understand where you're at while you're on your journey, if you're getting better, or would you disengage from that? What would you say? With peace and love, they're not even good at that. Because the tests they give you don't tell you anything unless you have to say the magic words. Do people typically know the names of the tests they actually need? So unless a person becomes educated on their own to know that the panels that they're giving them are the ones that don't tell them nothing, to go, see, look, you're fine. Hey, that's great. This said nothing. You just checked my levels. Uh, whatever thyroid hormones that shift anyways, multiple times in a day, depending on the circadian rhythm. I'm just using one example. They don't give you the goods. You have to actually say the secret codes and then they go, oh no, you don't need that. You don't need that. And then you guess what? You end up finding out you did need that. So they're not even useful. What a person should do is actually, <laughs> and once again, what I did, I didn't know this stuff at first. I became a doctor. I became my doctor. But at first, it just ran off of intuition. I went, okay, um, I'm going to send a full blood panel to my chiropractor because they were telling me, you're fine, you, nothing's wrong, take Xanax, you're anxious, whatever. So I'm like, no. I sent a full blood panel that I had to pay out of pocket. And that's what I found out, the words autoimmunity. I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what that world, I didn't know the body can attack itself. But I was deep in it at that point. So if a person wants to really, you know, harness <laughs> their doctors or or even just their doctors are, are more receptive and they don't need to harness them, then yeah, sure. But I wouldn't even say go down that route because that route only is good if it's like, oh, you're dead. Oh, look, we saw this test and it says you're dead. Like, unless you're already deeply in a, a, a very chronically ill disease, they, they don't have markers. That's why functional health practitioners, they look for function. Their, their blood labs aren't looking for how diseased you are. They're looking for, wait, 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 this is a functioning marker for your, the liver. This is how the... They're looking for if there's been a loss of function. They're catching things before they even tumble we down into that. So I would recommend people, if anything, to look for a functional health practitioner if they don't want to get all woo, if they still want to stay grounded, you know, like for me, I don't care anymore. Once, you know, I use my functional health practitioners, but then, okay, bye, <laughs> like went off to woo. But if some people, you know, need need that support. Functional health practitioners are looking for loss of function, and that's extremely beneficial for a person who wants to heal. I know that is so true when it comes to hormones. If you have a doctor read your hormones, you're fine. If you go to somebody who is practicing in hormones, a healer in hormones, they will look at your panel and go, oh, yeah, you're really low here. You know, this is why this is going on. I mean, they read it. You, they can read your body in a whole different way that answers things. Absolutely same is true for thyroid. Oh my gosh, you're too high. You're too low. You're just, and they always like that range, right? You're right in the range. You're doing good. You're like, I'm not doing good. <laughs> There's something entirely different going on. I appreciate what you're, you think you're seeing on paper, but I'm telling you what's happening in my body. And it is not living in that range very well that you're talking about. It's really maddening. Absolutely. So we have to see when to stop making excuses, even if there's well intention, you know, because if the well, it's not really well intention if it's coming from the mechanical state of, oh, well, I meant well, I was learned from the system from that. So that's why, even though I'm typically a neutral or inclusive person, I definitely discern what things need to just like know, uh, just be very straightforward and truthful about because that is enormously poisonous, dangerous, and um, harmful. And that needs to be said that way without any type of apology around it. Yeah. 
I like the fact that you said you use muscle testing. I think that's really important for people because nobody knows your body better than you and your soul. And if you use the muscle testing and the also pendulums, if you like to use a pendulum, this is this is powerful medicine that can tell you don't take this, do take this, don't go to this person for help, go to this person. And the fact that on your journey, you know, things things worked out. Congratulations, because that's that is magic. That's magic. I want to. That reminds me. I I saw something on your website that was like, oh, that sounds kind of yummy, and it was about uh, the mystics having a very particular approach to manifestation, and. So if manifestation is ancient, and we know it is, um, and it connects us to being creator beings, what is the mystical approach to manifesting? The mystical approach, I can creatively say this way, even though this isn't how I was taught it. It would be, do you want to manifest with source or without? <laughs> when you're in integrity, now you have source behind you. Now you're in alignment with source. Now you're even an agent of source. I mean, you're really source, but also, you know, because of the Trinity, you're source, but you're also an, ex an agent mm -hmm. of source. So who is our higher aspect? We're all source, right? Who is our higher aspect going to flood in with all of the raw materials for their manifestation? Somebody who's in integrity? or somebody who's coming from programming, automation, denial, deflection, uh, um, quick fixes, um, what have you. And so it's fine. I also don't wanna shame anyone around manifesting because manifesting is a part of our core identity. And what I see people do is either bash it and like shame people, but it's like, that's a part of our nature. We're literally here to manifest. So, or they just are all about manifestation and they're looking for kind of like um, spirit of the age techniques. And so what I just teach is how I've manifested. <laughs> I manifest through integrity. So let's say I wanted to present myself to you in a certain way, because if I presented myself to you in a certain way, I feel like you would like me more or your audience would like me more. Would that be an integrity? Well, that's a great question. I don't know about integrity, but I'll go there. Um, I would say it would not because it's not integral to who you really are. In a way, you're bastardizing yourself to receive something as opposed to just being you, a source creator, and trusting, well, the chips will fall where they may, but also trusting that, you know, you probably will be liked. And if not, that you're okay with that too. Yeah. And so being a clear channel, if you will, to be like the chips fall where they may, we're in polarity. We're in a realm of light, which will naturally have the polarity of shadow. So not everyone's going to like you. It's quite toxic to try to feign chemistry with everyone because it's literally not a part of this universe to have chemistry with everyone. So rather than being concerned, even if it's innocently, you know, like the shadows typically, typically innocent. So it's always about compassionate inquiry, not like, do you did that? Who did that? <laughs> it's just about like, oh, well, oh, I wanted to be liked. <laughs> or oh, I did it. Well, whatever it is. Like sometimes even shadow work kind of gets portrayed in a, like a diabolical way. Um, but yeah, it's just a matter of being aware enough. And then with that awareness, using it to always try to like refine our integrity. And so my integrity doesn't say I am a vessel of truth always and forever. What I say is 100% truth. It's this is my strongest connection to my truth right now. And I'm going to come with that. And in the background, I'm going to always stay open to a higher truth. Ooh, if we could go through life that way. I am staying open to truth right now. And in the background, I'm going to be open to a higher truth. That's like being a completely present satellite dish, if you will,
but the signal is is not like this, although it's broadcasting out there, but it's also really aligned, right? Central channel, right? Source and even your your own soul, its highest soul, it seems to me being like that. Yeah. And speaking of alchemical and you being an alchemist, what are the different alchemical meanings behind water and its connection to ether as well as its connection to mercury? So water is what was known as ether, but also what I would call prima materia, because that's like all alchemy is about. Like all alchemists are like whole oh, prima materia. And so there's lots of code words for prima materia. One of them is mercury. The prima materia is one of those concepts. You know how some concepts, the larger they are, the more names they have. Mm. So water is correlated with prima materia. And prima materia, the best way I could describe it is ether or spirit. So the prima materia can be looked at as like the highest form of matter, even though it's not matter, it's spirit. So if I had to kind of like say this another way that's more comprehensible, it's consciousness right? Because what's everything? Everything is consciousness. And so water was one of the ways, one of the, that was a way that they used to describe the prima materia when it's in different phases of creation, right? Because if it's everything, then you when it's being something else, when it's being something that's not everything, when it's like, oh, it's water, right? Water is not everything. When it's being something else other than everything, which is the prima materia, then at that point, it's like zooming in. It's like zooming in to the pixelations. So it's like, well, how do you create out of like, like prima materia can be like the Play-Doh. But then once you start taking pieces out and forming different things, like elements or this or this or that, that's what they were calling water. They were calling water like, oh, they separated the astral light, the lower astral light from the higher astral light. Or sorry, the lower astral waters, or no, the lower waters from the higher waters. It's like, what do you mean? What's waters were being separated from waters that was them saying it was the plato it was separating the prima materia from the prima materia so that there was an earth realm and there was a celestial realm so that there was a fourth dimension and then there was a fifth dimension and da, da, da. and so water is that name when prima materia is in its form of creating does that make sense wow this is this is so esoteric for me i am I'm with you and I'm I'm working to follow you. So I'm not sure that I fully understand what you're saying. Thank you for asking. Yeah. And then also in esotericism, there's a lot of different like double words. And so also waters meant like your trials and tribulations in life. So like if someone was going through a dark night of the soul, then it would be like they're in deep waters. So that's referring to their emotional reality through their trials and tribulations or um one of the most common ways waters was used is as a way of saying this is a true source of knowledge this is not an impure source of water or knowledge and so knowledge and wisdom were also equated as water so it's funny because in esotericism unless you just really love unraveling complex things uh you just kind of like get confused <laughs> Yeah, forest and trees kind of thing. Very cool. And so what is the difference between densities and dimensions? So how I relate them is densities are kind of like the floor. When we go in an elevator, we go to the first floor, the second floor, the third floor. So in this respect, what people are calling dimensions 
would actually be considered densities because they're going like, oh, I'm going to the third density. You would go up or down into that floor of the building. Now, when you get out of the elevator, you go and you see all these different doors. I would consider those dimensions. So that's where it's like, wait, is another parallel me doing better? That would be in a parallel dimension within the density. Does that make sense? Yes. That's so funny you say that. Sometimes, so I have a morning shamanic practice, like this is so personal, but I have a morning shamanic practice. And there's a certain point where I call in particular energies to work with me. And sometimes when I think about it, I do call in myself in other dimensions, but I'm really specific. So the being uh, that's part of my soul, but also having a life in a parallel universe or another dimension and it's doing really well and i'll and sometimes i'll even be very specific like and it's really advanced you know i call he she it in to work with me and guide me and give me wisdom you know besides benevolent beings from star family and i, I have a whole thing They're still all you right i think they must laugh sometimes just to hear hear the litany <laughs> from me in the morning and like, we're all one, sweetie. <laughs> we're here anyway. But I just know, especially with archangels and angels, they like to be asked. So I figure it can't hurt. <laughs> I'll ask oh. them all so they know it's okay to work with me anytime I receive. <laughs> and so something you do, which I think is very interesting because I'll just preface this by saying when people get readings, I, I just see this a lot. You know, if somebody's on stage and teaching and people are asking questions, they will often say, what's my purpose? Why am I here? And one of the things you talk about is what being on earth means for our purpose right now. So can you talk about what is our purpose? what purpose actually is and how it coincides with earth as an entity, her purpose as well. Yeah. So our purpose is to share ourselves with the world and that will change as we change. So a lot of people think like they're waiting for a scroll that they never got the message from that was lost at sea so that they can unravel it and be like, your purpose was blah, blah, blah. And that, that would take all free will out of the person's creative process. So instead it's a 50, 50, it's the person's purpose or intention to experience before coming into this life mixed with our creative process. So if I had the intention of helping earth raise its collective consciousness, how Sarah chooses to do that is my own creative process is my own free will but i have that intention so i will be very strongly magnetized to that purpose even though it's not a detailed purpose and mm. then from there it's like poetry oh mm. and then from poetry teaching and from teaching you know like it just evolves as i evolve and that's what purpose is for everyone and it's less vague than that though, too, because we all come in with certain skill sets as well. So it's kind of like, once again, laying re ingredients out and then going like, how are you going to mix them together? A person might choose to not acknowledge at all their skills. Or they might and say, I'm going to just use this, you know, it just feels right. Is it going to make me money? No, not yet. It might, but it just feels right, you know, like not putting so much pressure on what gives them the life force that would one day perhaps be considered something along the lines of a purpose or even fulfillment. I love that because people like yourself that I know who are highly gifted are hyphens. They're rarely one thing. They have come in with multiple gifts that they want to express out loud. And I really appreciate how you couch that 
that, you know, to not attach the financials to it, that's pretty huge in our society because you may be doing something you love already and something else may come along that wants to present or be expressed. And just to allow that to, you know, have its own life force be expressed as it should. And, and it's true. I mean, you know, when you follow energy and you're doing something, sometimes something else comes and there's another turn, another turn, or sometimes it becomes bigger in your space, what you're doing, or it weaves into other things of what you're doing. And I especially appreciate that because I'm kind of sitting on the precipice of, I love, love, love what I do. Love it. I love, I feel so honored who I work with. Do I feel like I was destined for that? I know I'm gifted in it. I don't know if I'm destined for it. I think I'm probably destined for a few other, a little bit bigger things that I'm just saying yes to, even though they're super uncomfortable right now, but also looking at the shamanism, like how does that weave? And I guess, you know, hearing what you're saying, it's like, you just do it, just do it. It's a Nike, just do it. And then see, you know, where it wants to go. I love that actually, as I'm saying it, because I am very sensitive to even the energy of things. And so I could, if I got out of the way, perceive where something's headed or wants to unfold. That was really organic. Thank you for <laughs> listening to that. And thank you for what you contributed there. And I think that's really big for the spiritual community to hear from you that this was part of your journey and continues to be. Is there anything for you, Sarah, that you feel like you're working on right now? Like your, has your year had a theme to it and things and that's caused you to work through things or learn things you wouldn't have otherwise? So just an element that I'm digging deeper into just because it's fun. And that's just making sure I don't fall into the fawn response. The what response? Fawn. Can you spell the, that? Where, where we go to appease people. Oh, right? fine. Because fine. I'm fine. Fawn. Everything's fine. Got it. Oh, it's fawn. Like, you know how you fawn over somebody? Fawn. F-A-W-N. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm working on, um, not that I had that as a major issue in my adult life, but that was a large theme for me growing up just because I was so different than my environment that I never got to ask the questions like, do you like these people? Do you even like them? No, you're just dependent on them for connection because, you know, um, and so I'm working through at a stronger level, even though as I said, in my adult life, that's what I would say become thoroughly transmuted. I'm revisiting that layer at a deeper level and just kind of cleaning up anything where there still might be a fawn response and not in like a negative way where I'm like, are you still in fawn? Just in a refined way so that I'm making sure that I'm not coming from my outdated survival mechanisms and programs that I'm so very grateful for, but that I no longer need to sustain me. Now mm. I can literally go, do, do I like, no, you're being interviewed, not you, but I mean, like the, the world, I, I, I am not at the mercy of the world's approval of me or even, you know, um, whatever it may be, I, I'm, I'm not dependent on that. So I'm not coming from a rebellious, you know, adversarial lens. It's just coming from a purified, neutral way of being able to connect with others in a way where there's no distortions of having needs met in maladaptive ways, mm -hmm. all because they were what I needed when I was younger. What an amazing way to say all of that, fawning over people and situations in order to get something. You'll take a lot of emotional and verbal abuse mm. when you're in that state. Yeah, because fawning has a component of need to it. <clears throat> Not just needing approval, but like I, I maybe I need you in my life or I need this in order to. And 
Yeah, that's a lot of giving up aspects of ourselves. I have to show you how funny you are so that you don't attack me. Mm. Things like that. Powerful stuff. I get that. I really get that. Thank you. Yeah. So this is Dare to Dream. What do you next dare to dream, Sarah? What are your future dreams and goals? Ooh, mm -hmm. um, a real live house, a house that I own. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a beautiful dream. Yeah, in yeah. Los Angeles or where? No, <laughs> I mean, anyone with an intuition. <laughs> no, but you know, um, yeah, I'm still vibing that one out. Right. So you travel. So I'm sure you suss places vibrationally as you travel to say, could I live here? What would this be like? Yeah. I've been Goldilocks for the past three years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beautiful. Like, Is it this place? Is it this? But yeah, you know, it's like, I feel like that song from Fleetwood Mac, Sarah, <laughs> when you build your house, call me home, like call me. Came, you know, a theme where I'm like, I, I want my own house that I own. Oh God. I love that too. I'm a water sign. So for me, a home, a nest, it's everything. Well, I wish that for you. It's a beautiful dream. And people can find you at the alchemist.community. I loved having you on this show and meeting you. Is there anything you want to tell the audience here at the end? I love you all. And I appreciate your presence and giving me the most important commodity in this universe, which is your attention. Mm -hmm. I end this show with this quote, in the dance of shamanic and quantum healing, we unlock the timeless wisdom of ancient spirits and the boundless potential of the universe within ourselves. Embrace the magic that lies at the intersection of these realms and watch as your soul transforms, guided by the whispers of the cosmos and the echoes of forgotten wisdom. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment. <clears throat> Next week on the show, my guest is the amazing Haumea Hanakahi, a highly gifted psychic, mystic, intuitive wisdom guide, zapper of energy blocks, and storyteller. Thank you so much for joining us today on Dare to Dream and post and comment about your takeaways. They were meant with so much love, and I'm so grateful you're all on this journey.